Thank you very much, and thank you for the invitation to speak today. Um, in preparation for tonight's talk, I decided, which is something that you think I would do before this, to Google so fertility and infertility. And what intrigued me was a lot of the dogmas and myths around surrounding um, the whole area of infertility. And so what I thought about was just deciding tonight to, to hopefully go through some of those dogmas, um, those myths, and, and see can we come to some form of conclusion. Um, so, um, and also as well, I was trying to think during the fire brigade talk what connection I could bring fertility into with them. Unfortunately, they have moved very quickly <laughs> and <laughs> not allowed this, but we may very much find some connection throughout this presentation. Okay, so one of the, lots of the main things that um, stuck out for me was that some sayings like, all you need is one sperm. It's a woman's problem. Just relax, and infertility is a psychological problem. It's all in your head. Adoption increases the chance of becoming pregnant. And it's not complicated, getting pregnant is easy. Now, in a lot of these questions, and a lot of these came from um, question and answer sessions, 67% of the audience believed in all these um, statements. So, what we'll do is get rid of them. And so we'll look at this talk as an aim of clarifying, clarifying and removing an, any <coughs> ambiguity for us all. So as you know, I'm Jerry Emerson, Deputy Lab Manager of the, and Research Development Officer at the Harry Unit. Uh, reducing your risk of experience of fertility and infertility is, is the topic tonight. Um, so, some of the myths, and I think we'll just deal with those and try and, and um, get through them quite quickly. Infertility is not limited to women. Infertility is not all in your head. Infertility is not limited to unhealthy people. Infertility is not limited to older couples. And infertility is not going to go away if you just relax and go on vacation. So, also, to deal with some unhelpful comments, Everyone seems to get pregnant at a drop of a hat. Don't worry too much. It just takes time. You'll get pregnant if you're just patient. If you adopt a baby, you'll get pregnant. Maybe you too are doing something wrong. Daily intercourse will improve your chances. Well, best of luck. <laughs> um, perhaps if this is God's way of telling you and you uh, that you two aren't meant to be parents. Extremely hurtful statement, but statements that are out in the domain. And infertility is nature's way of controlling the population. All of these are untrue. So just to start quickly with the definition, subfertility and infertility are very closely linked. Subfertility is the reduced fertility with prolonged time to unwent, unwanted non-conception. Infertility is the in inability to conceive for 12 months with regular vaginal intercourse. And we have two types of infertility, primary and secondary. Primary uh, infertility is a subsection of couples who have never achieved a pregnancy, i.e. that they have never had a positive pregnancy test. Secondary infertility is very much on the uprise. Um, we deal with a lot of couples who would have said that we had no problem conceiving our first child um, and no problem conceiving even our second child. But the longing for that third child has overcome them and therefore they have found that there's no um, pregnancy ensuing as easily as before. Um, also secondary infertility can deal with miscarriages um, but no live births. So in the normal population, per se normal, 20% um, of couples will conceive within one month, 70% within six months, 85% will conceive in 12 months, and 90% will conceive within 18, and 95% will conceive within 24 months. And that's the National Health Survey in UK. 
So for those other population of people after the one year, um, certainly anxiety can take apart. Those other comments that we've just spoken about can be said and add to their to the level of stress within the couple. The incidence, 14 percent, one in every seven couples. 25 percent of couples take longer than they would like to achieve their desired family size. And that's very important. Desired family size may be for us or myself in, in Ireland one or two children. Um, for other couples it may be that they have started their their uh, partnership looking to have five, six children. So that is an individual um, perception of what their desired family size would be. So calculation wise in the Irish population, we would say over 400,000 couples will have a problem or a delay in achieving their desired family size. Okay, so it, 20 to 40% of couples will have multiple causes, okay? Male factor infertility ranges from 20 to 25 percent. This can involve, you know, poor motility, low sperm counts, raised abnormal forms. Anovulation, this is more or less to deal with the female. 15 to 20 percent of what we see is due to anovulation, and that's people, ladies who have either ovulated once or twice a year or no ovulation whatsoever. Tubal disease is within 15 to 40 percent range. Endometriosis and unexplained infertility make up the rest up to 10 to 30 percent. So a rough guide, as this says, is a rule of a third. A third male factor, third female factor, and a third combined factor. We also deal with anatomical and psychosexual problems. Quite enough of people that we see will never require IVF, um, will never require to actually enter into a fertility unit. What we do provide is a lot of counselling service for couples who have psychosexual problems. And we also deal with uterus or ladies that may have a uterus with a, uh, an anatomical problem from birth. So quickly, what we look at is the female reproductive system, and that includes ovaries, fallopian tubes, uterus, endometrium, cervix, and a vagina. Um, so basically, the ovaries are where the eggs are, are stay, um, are growing. The fallopian tubes aid that egg at the point of ovulation um, to enter into the tube and also um, meet with the sperm in the actual end of the tube. The uterus is where the, hopefully the fertilized implanted embryo will implant and also the endometrium which is the lining of the womb needs to be receptive at that time. The cervix is a barrier from the sperm um, after ejaculation into the vagina so therefore the cervix will be used to clear um, any seminal fluid away and allow in only good sperm. So um, what we need to do is for us all to understand the basis of ovulation. Now, this is a very busy slide, but really what I want to get through is that we as girls are born, all our eggs um, are formed in, uh, in the fetus stage as we're developing in our, in our mothers. So anything that we do throughout our lifespan insults those eggs. And what I mean by insulting them, from smoking, from the use of drugs, from the use of, um, from not using good sexual um, reproductive health, and the use of condoms, attaining uh, STIs, um, and so forth. We are constantly insulting our oocytes, our eggs, that are lying dormant in those ovaries. So each month we have a production of LH hormone. This LH releases one of these eggs, and these eggs will grow um, up to maturity and be released and collected by the fallopian tube, where the egg will hopefully meet with the sperm. Um, and these eggs then will travel down into the uterus and implant in the endometrium, what uh, everything is healthy. Fertilization obviously occurs in the fallopian tubes 12 to 24 hours after ovulation. So timing is extremely important. So to, certainly when we're embarking on any form of 
conception, we need to understand the absolute basics of ovulation. And to remember, and this is for any couple or young lady or men, to remember that sperm survives for up to 72 hours in the female tract. So if you're trying to avoid pregnancy, be very well aware of that. Um, and obviously if you are trying to conceive. So therefore going back on one of our previous dogmas, you don't have to have intercourse every single day. So one of the main causes of female infertility is called polycystic ovarian syndrome. Now one in five females of reproductive age suffer from this condition. Um, so it goes quite often undiagnosed and it manifests itself in irregular and absent periods, lack of ovulation, weight gain, acne, excessive facial hair and infertility and depression. Why I really want to talk about polycystic ovary syndrome like this is that while people think, oh, that's an infertility problem, that's you know something that a clinic can sort out, lots of these other issues here can be sorted out in general by the loss of at least 5 to 10 percent of the full body mass index, and therefore ovulation can reoccur. Um, therefore taking care of the weight gain. Acne, excessive facial and hair can be taken care of cosmetically. And depression is something that I think is a public um, awareness campaigns and so forth. But these ladies do have tendencies. So certainly when you have somebody fitting at least four or five of these requirements, polycystic ovarian syndrome, um, and follow on from that infertility can be lessened by the time reproductive age or certainly after or in someone's early 20s when they are looking to start a family. So it's, it's common awareness to these kind of, you know, um, very, very f much a feature of polycystic or are taken care of in the adolescent phase and into the early 20s then certainly a lot of polycystic ovarian syndrome ladies can get pregnant on their own. So even a more serious, as I say, risk as well is the developing of cardiovascular disease in these ladies and type 2 diabetes, also endometrial cancers. So certainly if there is a diagnosis of any of three or four of these points here, then certainly um, young females should be aware and seek help. The male reproductive system, and I apologise to every male in this audience because this looks like to me like a stool. <laughs> but again, it involves very, very, a lot of organs and a lot of glands. So therefore, any trauma to the testicle area, any trauma to any of these glands or non-functioning of these glands can very much lead to infertility in the male. Um, each of them are required for specific reasons. Um, the testis itself houses Sartoli cells, seminiferous tubules, the epididymis where the sperm is stored for up to 48 days, the vas deferens where it actually is used to bypass the seminal fluid into the penis and for ejaculation, um, and the likes of the Cowper's gland um, and any other glands there, um, what is needed is nourishment for the sperm as it's ejaculated. So risk factors and also the insults that we do on a daily basis to our reproductive cells. Much more severe in the female, as I said, because we are born with all our eggs. Um, not so much in the male, because the male has continued reproductive cycle of 30 days. So from the time a sperm cell is taken in its Sartoli cell phase, it takes 30 days for that to come to maturity. So we, we obviously age over time, we smoke, we consume alcohol. In this date of 2013, we're bombarded by the thoughts of obesity and overweight, eating disorders, um, over-exercising, not exercising, sexually transmitted infections such as chlamydia, very common, sexually transmitted disease. And the worry with chlamydia is that it shows no signs of presence. 
and therefore Ireland does not have a full wide scale of screening for chlamydia. Um, and in that respect, if it remains untreated, 70% of young females will end up with pelvic inflammatory disease and therefore blocked fallopian tubes. Very easily treated with antibiotics. Um, and also we have to deal with the exposure now to chemicals in our environment. Chemicals, we have now something like over 24,000 chemicals. We don't know what or how they perform as regards into our reductive nature and also to our future offspring. But certainly there has been studies showing at least 240 of those environmental chemicals that are in use um, can show signs of reduced sperm counts. Um, also mental stress. Mental stress not so much stops sperm and egg meeting, but also it can just it will more or less involve itself in the actual partnership between the couple. So if a couple themselves, while it doesn't, as I said, doesn't affect the sperm and egg getting together, it may very well affect the actual coital um, undertaking itself. Because certainly if I come home after a long day at work and I'm stressed, it would be the last thing that I would want on my agenda. <laughs> So fertility and age, a very old slide here. This slide was taken in the 1970s and still holds true very much today. What we can see here, very much for 100,000 wives, and this shows you how old this slide is because we used to have to be married to undergo any, any assisted reproduction technique. And in my 20 odd years, I have witnessed people having to get married the day before their egg collection. So their honeymoon was spent in an IVF clinic. But what we can see over time, gradually, and then you look down at 38, absolutely drops down. So what we're looking at here is, even though these could be very, very healthy females and very healthy men, and you've lived a life of full health, no smoking, very little alcohol, if none, um, no sexually transmitted diseases, very proud of your lifestyle. Again, we cannot overcome age. And because we're living in a society, and maybe it's a social issue and so forth, and also um, for ladies who wish to continue with careers, and this again to me is a public issue, and needs to be brought very much to government, um, government forums, that ladies who have been pushed through careers or financial situations into delaying their families will eventually end up with a very low fertility outcome. So when we talk about smoking, this here is an egg from a 35-year-old lady, okay? Very, very nice, has everything that we wanted to do, very clear cytoplasm, nice, quite thin, zona pellucida, this is the covering of the egg that we work with. Okay, and here is the polar body. This is the first sign of maturation of an oocyte. So this is what we would love to see every day in our laboratories. Well, actual fact, we don't want to see it, we want to see it obviously have a natural conception, but if you end up with us, this is exactly what we want to see. Here, as I can point out here, are eggs from a 35-year-old patient who does smoke. Here, you can see the abnormalities in the, the cytoplasm. The polar body looks okay, but this is all granulated. Okay. Here again, more granulation. We know that they have lower implantation. Um, we know that these don't fertilize particularly well. These here, these little small little circles, which I'm not sure if you can see, would probably be a new site that we wouldn't use because we know that they give rise to abnormalities in offspring. And here certainly is something that we would not want to use. So dealing with a couple, going back to the previous slide of someone who does not smoke, who has the same hormonal levels, who had the same cycle undertaken with us, and you introduce smoking, this is what you're dealing with in, in abnormal zonas here very clearly. 
and we'll, while we do get pregnancies, and some people are affected more and more by smoking, and certainly in the Harry unit, and I don't know if anybody knows where it's situated, but it's right smack in the Rotunda Hospital. People have to go by the smoking shed to get to us. And there's a lady there delivering, as you know, over 9,000 deliveries, and the smoking shed is packed. And our poor ladies have been told not to drink, not to smoke, you know, sit down and, and rest and so forth. So it's very hard to get this through to our, our young ladies of reproductive age. So for every male in the audience, you'd be delighted to know we still require you. Okay, and this is probably what I wanted to talk to the, <laughs> the, the fire brigade men about, is that we still read men, okay? Even with all the, the media attention that we get that, you know, we're now creating sperm in laboratories, that's not particularly true, okay? Men themselves can have their own disorder, testicular disorders. They can have congenital disorders, just as Kleinfelter syndrome. Kleinfelter syndrome is where there's an extra X, y, X chromosome in the makeup of the cells in, in, a, in a male. We can have cryptocidism, always have problems with that word, but this basically is a failure of testicular descent. So for all mothers, the first thing you do before you allow your son to be brought home from the hospital is to check that his test days are down. Okay? If they are not down, that operation has to take place under the age of five. If it goes anywhere above that age, you will be guaranteed he will end up in an infertility clinic, and we deal with it constantly. We deal with it constantly because young men aren't checked appropriately that their test days are down in the scrotum. They actually are up in the body at 37 degrees, and the reason why God put the test is outside was because he wanted it at 35 degrees. And if you keep the test days at 37 degrees over prolonged periods of time, you will cease spermatogenesis. And that spermatogenesis is the formation of sperm. So very simple, again, just check young males. Varus caseals. This is something males themselves can do. Um, and obviously, I don't know every man in the world, but I can guess that majority do check themselves at some stage. Well, I hope they do. Um, the varicocele, it's called a dilation of the scrotal venous plexus, meaning that there is a large vein on the scrotum. Okay? If that is present, it needs to be investigated by a urologist. A urologist can then decide whether or not to remove that vein. The reason that if that vein is there, it causes again heat to the testicle that should not be present. It rises the test day's temperature. So we've got lots in common with the fire brigade. Heat. <laughs> Cystic fibrosis. Um, does anybody know or any idea of how Ireland fa fares on the cystic fibrosis calendar? Extremely high, absolutely. We are one in 19. Um, carriers, okay? The main situation with cystic fibrosis is that majority are azospermic. Azospermic meaning no sperm whatsoever. So what we need to do and what we can do is go into the test days and take out the tissue present and look for sperm in that. And they're quite successful and outcomes are extremely successful. But the whole history of cystic fibrosis in Ireland is extremely interesting and certainly something worthwhile for people to look into. And the reason why Ireland has such a high cystic fibrosis situation is because of the Irish famine. They survived very well. People with lesser um, lung capacity survived extremely well towards our other European counterparts. Infections, obviously mumps is something to be aware of in your young men. It can cause azospermia. Radiation, drugs, alkaline neutral or drugs. These drugs are commonplace, taken very much in, obviously, oncology circumstances. These can render males sterile. But, and unfortunately, there isn't much that we can do about it, but just to make the public aware, 
that the service is there and every young man of reproductive age should speak straight away to the oncologist that are diagnosing because we know from a lot of the studies that we do, oncologists don't tend to refer a lot of their young men of reproductive age for sperm banking. It's available, it's free of charge, and it certainly has provided a lot of young couples with their own biological offspring in the last number of years. Um, and the use of st allobotic steroids. We all love to see nice chunky males, well some of us do, um, walking into a nightclub. But if he's too chunky, his testicles are small. Okay? <laughs> they are. <laughs> okay, and we have dealing with this constantly. But if you can get him off his anabolic steroids, which is very hard to do because they like to look good, okay? If sperm can re come back in within 12 to, or at least 12 to 18 months, okay? So, you know, we've all dealt with stories in, in, in fertility clinics, and a very, very unfortunate one was a very high profile rugby stars, okay? Dealing with anabolic steroids, in, not in the professional scene, but just in the college scene. Passing needles in dressing rooms, taking steroids, not just reducing their sperm count, but also obtaining HIV virus. Okay? So this is happening, and it needs to be made aware. So, normal semen analysis, okay? What we want to see is over two mils of sperm, should you need that uh, to perform a semen analysis. And before actually we go into this, if it comes to a stage where you feel that we need to move forward, it has been 18 months, I am getting older now, now that we've gone through a lot of what we have, make sure that the GP or whoever you've seen first refers or treats you both as a couple. Infertility is not a woman's problem. It's not a man's problem. It's a couple's problem, okay? It's also got to do with the fact that we deal with a lot of couples who the female has been focused on completely. And we deal constantly as well with couples who have gone to their GP and the GP has said, I won't treat you from there down, I'll only treat you from there up. Okay, and this is 2013. So, make sure the semen analysis is done because we've gone through a lot of women who have been on Clomid, which is an infertility drug, for over 12 months and to only to find that nobody has bothered to check the male and he has no sperm whatsoever. Okay. So what we want is a volume of two mils. If we don't see a volume of two mils, what we are then looking for straight away is the likes of retrograde ejaculation where the ejaculation is not happening normally and that's associated with uncontrolled diabetes. So if you have your male partner has diabetes but not controlling it well, he may very well have ejaculatory problems. Again, controlled diabetes, and these things can improve themselves. Concentration, greater than 20 million per mil, so that throws the one sperm out of the water straight away. We want to see motility of above 50%, and normal morphology above 4%. So a lot of people get upset when I say you've got 96% abnormal sperm. I don't know why, but they do. <laughs> um, but as long as we see 4% of them normal, that's a normal ejaculate. MAR test, which is, needs to be negative, which is what we call an anti-sperm antibody test. Anti-sperm antibody test can happen from trauma to the testicle. Trauma to the testicle can happen in a sporting accident. It can happen in a reverse vasectomy failure. It can happen in any hernia operation. It's where the blood and the sperm barrier break down and become, basically fight each other. And therefore, because sperm only have half the chromosomes needed, obviously the egg will have half the chromosomes needed, and because all of our other cells have doubled that amount of chromosomes, it will start to kill off the sperm and start to fight it. 
also anti-sperm antibodies give rise to miscarriages. So that's another dogma that we need to do, throw out, is that miscarriage is not a female factor in itself. It can give rise to it, but the male can give rise to miscarriages as well. So we can look at sperm DNA now. It's also DNA in the sperm is a complex chemical and carries genetic information. It's tightly packed in the head of the sperm and it controls fertilization, embryo development, and also plays a part in miscarriage. <coughs> we do, when we can test for DNA fragmentation indexes, um, it can, DNA can be damaged in the head of the sperm, and also damaged DNA will not function properly. As we said earlier, can produce pregnancies which will end in early miscarriage. So, what the studies are telling us now, if you perform a simple DNA fragmentation index, you will actually see that in less than, if the result comes back less than 15%, you know that you've got a good chance of normal conception, and you may not need to enter into a fertility program. If it's in a 15 to 25% ratio, then what we were saying to couples is that you may very well never conceive in the normal situation and you need some assistance. And here, if it's greater than 25%, you need more high-tech ART, artificial treatments. So what can we do instead of entering into an IVF center, instead of actually needing a DNA fragmentation index? We know that this can happen in males over and greater than ages of 48. So not just the woman has a biological clock, also, the male has a biological clock. Pollutants and pesticides that we work with on a daily basis can cause it. Certain medication, cholesterol-lowering drugs, drugs for benign swelling of the prostate, antidepressants, and also high doses of paracetamol. So, obviously, we're not advocating anybody to come off anything that's prescribed by a GP, but certainly it'd be worthwhile for any male who is trying to uh, conceive to go and talk to the GP about maybe altering some of these drugs. So we advocate lifestyle, lifestyle and lifestyle. Smoking, again, always gets hit, but it's certainly something that does impact. Being overweight, again, has an impact and certainly this can obviously increase again the heat to the testes. So when we interview a lot of males who are coming for their first semen analysis, we find that they may say, you know, after a long conversation, how do you relax in the evening? Oh, I go home and I sit in the bath for two and a half hours. He obviously has a very kind wife, but sitting in a hot bath for two and a half hours will add heat to your testicles. And if you're doing that on a daily basis, it will reduce your sperm count. Um, obviously, uh, to also reiterate occupation. So again, we hit on pollutants and pesticides. We also want to hit on overweight and sitting in the same position for quite a long time. So we deal, we deal a lot with long haul, um, long haul drivers of, of uh, trucks. So what we advocate with them is to actually get up, break their drive, and go for a walk and air. Not just inhaling it, but to air down below as well. Um, so poor diet, and also more than one litre of sugar drinks a day can affect your sperm count. Mobile phone in your front jeans, how many men hang that in around there? Great, um, but a lot of males that we do see around the place carry their mobile phones in the front of their pockets. Uh, obviously, we would say take <coughs> it out, your laptop, if you sit with your laptop on your lap, not looking at anyone, for two hours or more <laughs> each day, that can cause more heat to your testicles as well. And infrequent ejaculation. We would advocate that males do have frequent ejaculation because if you don't and you're trying for conception then the sperm that is produced which is a consistent consistently produced in the test days will start to die off be stored in the epididymis 
and that will be the first sperm that's ejaculated. It will have abnormalities raised and it will also not have the capability of fertilization. So what we advocate is that you certainly have intercourse two days before ovulation following the plan of the female ovulation and then obviously around the time of ovulation and then a day or so after ovulation. So also the advantages of DFI testing, it, lifestyle change can improve it, correct treatment first time, an indicator of general health. We can actually see if the man has been ill over the last couple of days, had a flu or anything else, just by looking at his sperm count. So what we want is happy and healthy sperm. So we want to stop smoking, maintain a healthy weight, varied and healthy diet rich in vitamin C and D and zinc. Okay? D very much more it seems to be coming for the, to the fro, whether or not it's the poor obviously sun that we get in Ireland, all those the hot Indian summers that we keep getting promised that don't happen. But certainly would be very much indicate very simple tests, go to the GP, check your vitamin D levels, if not then take supplements. Avoid long periods of sitting or tight clothing. People smile and laugh, but this actually works. Avoid elevating any temperature, testicular temperature. And of course, the mobile phone out of the pocket. Wash fruit and vegetables prior to consumption. You don't know what pesticides have been used and they're grown. Low GI diets, frequent ejaculation, and talk about your concerns. So what we did here was I was going to show you some image of normal sperm, but I don't think it's going to work this evening. But anyway, if we just point out here, well on this slide normally it, it's, it's flowing very quickly and you'll see sperm moving at a very fast pace. And this is a normal ejaculate, okay? There's a tail and the head and they're moving quite quickly. When we see problems with testicular heat, and certainly from gentlemen who may have been long haulage drivers, or not to just pick on those, but anybody who's working in aerial pesticides and so forth, will see poor sperm. You'll see heads bent here, maybe a bit of a longer tail. This here, absolutely grossly abnormal sperm, and here. And these very much are not moving at all, quite stuck to each other and have no indication to go near any egg and go for a look. So. Finally, what we need to do is overall reduce our risk and firstly look after any health issues that we have, diabetes, any lumps, anything else that we need to investigation. Look after your reproductive health by using condoms, um, female or any worry about any STIs, swiftly go to and take away any stigma involved in this because this is about your future long term health. Female adolescent years are great pointers. If you have had only one period, two periods within a year, um, that should be investigated because again, when you start to look at your reproductive length of time, that may very well be shortened for you. Protection of the testes during impact sports. And we know that we live in a very society of hurling, football, and so forth. Um, and certainly we see injuries to the test days and therefore anti-sperm antibodies presence. So again, if worried, seek advice. So just to finally talk about assisted reproduction techniques, they are there, they are available, but if you follow the rules of what we spoke to tonight, it may very much not be necessary for people to enter into these programs. We have time sexual intercourse, we have IVF in vitro fertilization, we have interuterine insemination, we have intercytoplasmic sperm injection, this is for severe male factor. We have pre-implantation genetic diagnosis now starting in Ireland where we're looking for single gene defects, looking for cystic fibrosis. So, and just overall and for my own interest, does anybody kind of think of what would the take home baby rate be after all these treatments? Would it be 70%? Less, higher? Less. Less than 50%? A very well educated audience. 
less than 30 percent? It's actually 20 percent. So, and the cost of an IVF cycle is 5,000 euros. Okay, thank you for your attention. You know, it's a public forum. Um, I thought that fertility, need, infertility certainly needs to be out because it's so much a personal, or it's perceived as a personal problem. Um, but I think it's more has a public agenda. And I think therefore that the, you know, more and more that it's spoken about than the, the um, hidden, you know, and the loneliness of infertility can some way be quashed, you know. We heard about it through somebody within ORS or CSI um, and the topic particularly interested us and particularly the, par the, the paramedic and the yeah. infertility. The yeah. lady we were talking. really amazed and surprised at the um, second talk. It was extremely interesting and delivered very, very well. You could understand everything that she was saying. It was um, very good and two such different topics. topics. Like both extremely enjoyable. I did come with just the intent of staying for the one by Dublin Fire Brigade, but I'm actually glad I stayed this evening and took a lot away from it. Um, a few things that you wouldn't even think of, especially the mobile phones within the front pockets for men, generating heat and things like that. So yeah, I've taken something away from it and hopefully it might make a change. She took a serious subject and something that affects all families. Um, but she took it and she did it very well, delivered it really, really well. And with humour, with, this, with this, a touch of humour as well, she lightened it. But they're very interesting. And I've been to most of the, the series now and intend to come to the next one. And I certainly will be at the next one. This is my first one that I'm really looking forward to now to the next. absolutely encourage the members of the public because you have access to professional people without having to obviously be there in a you know to show your whole personal interest in things but you can be just part of a group and listen to other people even if you don't want to ask a question someone else may ask the question for you it's very very well done it's a very good series so well done to the RCSI yes. <laughs>